Well, thank you all for being here tonight. Um, Pastor Mark had the privilege and the opportunity to be with our dear friend Larry Hutton and a bunch of other pastors, and they are in Florida, um, and he's playing golf, so it's not like he's... <laughs> Sorry. I wish I could say he was saving everybody. Well, he is. Maybe he's praying for people. He, you know, he did show me a crocodile or an um, alligator on the field today, and um, that was exciting for me. <laughs> ah. But we all know Pastor Mark can take it, right? He's, he's waiting for that opportunity. <laughs> good Lord. But he's having a good time and um, getting away with men of God. And they're having um, such great fellowship, you know, talking about the goodness of God and just encouraging each other. He said his game's not so great, <laughs> but he's having a good time. And, you know, I don't know what his game is not so great. I'm sure it's still very good. We went axe throwing one time. Did I tell you that story? Oh, my goodness. And, you know, it's the first time I ever threw an axe in my life, so I was a little scared. And you should be scared because if you see me throw an axe, it bounces and comes back. So, yeah, I was scared. But he would say, I'm going to put it right there. I'm going to put it right there. So, you know, I'm like, man, don't give this man a sword. Give him an axe, you know. <laughs> Forget the guns. He needs an axe. But... um Anyway, we, we miss you, honey. I'm sure you're watching, and, um, but thank you all for being here. Let's open uh, in prayer for the Word of God. Father, we just thank you for your Word, your Word. Oh, it's just so, so wonderful to worship you this night, God, to declare that Jesus is Lord, <laughs> to lift up the name of Jesus, how we worship you and honor you, and I give you this moment, I give you this time. You love every man, every woman in this room. Everyone that's tuning in to listen to this program tonight. God, I thank you that you have a word for us. You have a word of encouragement for us, your church. You said that upon this rock, I will build my church. And Lord, I thank you that the gates of hell will not prevail. Lord, I thank you again, the greater one lives inside of us. We thank you that we are seated with Jesus in heavenly places on that seat and that throne of victory tonight. Oh, and we thank you that we have victory in your name, Jesus. Lord, we honor you. We glorify you. We are not distracted by the things in this world. Lord, you said when all these things happen that we are to lift up our eyes towards heaven for our redemption draws nigh. Hallelujah. Thank you for redemption, Lord. In the powerful name of Jesus, and everybody said, amen, amen. amen. Well, um, I want to share tonight, uh, I'm sure many of you have um, seen on the news, our wonderful um, female running presidential election person lady, <laughs> um, what she did this week or this last week, it was just awesome. I want to I start by saying this. There was a prophecy that was given out at the beginning of this year by a, a man of God, and I want to say this because I think it's so great. He said, it's going to be Christ or culture. And that we are going to be making a defining line if we're either we're for Christ or for culture. And, um, and who you choose to stand behind. He said it will be like paddling against a tsunami, but God will strengthen or as we push against the tide of evil. So don't be intimidated. Keep your back to what looks like will overtake you. And do not eat, you do not even have to face it, just push against it. But he said this, he said that in this time, there's going to be a gift that God is going to give us. And that gift is truth. And he said, don't be angry when God begins to bring truth out to the forefront because we're going to see truth versus lies. And the deception that has been so hidden is going to be completely unveiled and we're going to know exactly where people stand in this hour. And the masks are going to come off and it's going to be even begin in the pulpits. It's going to happen in the political world. It's happening in the music world. It's happening everywhere we can see where God is bringing truth and he's 
he's uh, unveiling the lies and the deceptions of the enemy. And God says it's a gift. And when he starts to uh, reveal the truth, he says, see it as a gift, not as a blow or destruction. When you see that those people that you had confidence and faith in, all of a sudden, you're, you're, when they start seeing or revealing who they're, what they're standing for and how they're standing, it should be very black and white. And again, it's Christ or culture in this hour. And I thought that was such a great word for what I want to share. And again, um, you know, you probably heard this Vice President Kamala Harris, how she shared on Thursday of last week in the University of Wisconsin. Uh, how many had heard that? Oh, how many haven't heard it? Wow, it's almost half and half. Okay, so... Um, so in the University of Wisconsin, Kamala Harris was having a rally, and um, there were two young students who are part of the Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin, so they have a right to be there, right? And um, they were at this rally, and she begins to talk about abortion, and um, oh man, I, I want to teach some time upon that because... There is such an unveiling that, that abortion stems into satanic worship, the sacrifice of children. And, um, and so she's talking about abortion. She's talking about a woman's right uh, to choose and, and the body. And these two young students who are Christians, they, uh, they proclaimed in the rally um, that Jesus is Lord and Jesus is king, a Christ is king. Um, these young students, his name was Luke and Grant. They're pro-life. They were, you know, they were believing in pro-life. And so they yelled out, Jesus is Lord, Christ is king. Um, this article says, this prompted Harris to retort. And this is what she said. Oh, guys, you are at the wrong rally. No, I think you meant to go to the smaller one down the street. And as she said that, what is so creepy is that a roar of cheer broke out in the, in the audience. And they began to cheer what she just said. Now, this is huge. This is huge. Because now we're seeing what she's saying is that I'm not standing. Jesus is not welcome in this campaign. And Jesus is not part of my campaign. If you want Jesus, you're going to have to go to the... Notice she said the smaller one down the street. Okay, um, and so what happened is these young men, um, they, they began, they, they were interviewed later, and they said that um, when this happened, uh, let's see, they said they began to get pushed and shoved, yep. and there's about five seconds before she tells us to go to a smaller rally down the street, you can see it on the video, they say, and she waves and was actually waving to one of the students. He took his cross, his necklace cross, and he kind of held it up. And when he did that, she looked directly at him in the eye, and she kind of waved and gave an evil smirk, he said. And so he said, I want to make sure that we're clear. She was 100% was talking to us. There was about 2,500 people in this um, rally, apparently. And so... Um, they began to, uh, a woman shoved and pushed one of them. They, they used profanity. They were cussing them out and mocking them. And then they were escorted out of the building and told that they were not welcome here and so that they had to leave. Now, this is huge. Turn with me into the Bible, into Jude. If you have your Bible, Jude chapter, uh, well, there's only one chapter. In <laughs> um, Jude... Um, It's the book just before the book of Revelation, all right? And um, I want to read to you out of Jude, starting with verse 3. He says, Now, dear friends, I've been eagerly planning to write to you about the salvation we all share, but now I find that I must write about something else. Now, this is I feel like this needs to be the message across every pulpit. I was eagerly planning to preach to you this series this message, but now I find I must write about, I must speak about something else, urging you to do what? To defend the faith that God has entrusted once for all time to his holy people. I say this because some ungodly people have wormed their way into your churches, 
saying that God's marvelous grace allows us to live immoral lives. The condemnation of such people was recorded long ago, for they've denied our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. Notice, ungodly people do what? They deny the master and the Lord Jesus Christ. All right? He, he goes on and he says, I want to remind you, though you already know these things, that Jesus first rescued the nation of Israel from Egypt, but later he destroyed those who did not remain faithful. And I remind you of the angels who did not stay within the limits of authority God gave them, but left the place where they belonged, and God has kept them securely chained in prisons of darkness, waiting for the great day of judgment. And don't forget about Sodom and Gomorrah and their neighboring towns, which were filled with immorality and every kind of sexual perversion. And these cities were destroyed by fire and serve as a warning of the eternal fire of God's judgment. And he goes on, and um, I want to skip down to just for sake of time, because I, I, I want to get to another place in the word of God. But go down to verse 17. But you, my dear friends, he's speaking to the church, you must remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ predicted. They told you that in last times there would be scoffers whose purpose in life is to satisfy their ungodly desires. And these people are the ones who are creating divisions among you. And they follow their natural instincts because they do not have God's spirit in them. But you, dear friends, must build each other up in your most holy faith. Pray in the power of the Holy Spirit and await the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ who will bring you eternal life. And in this way, you will keep yourselves safe in God's love. Now, what I want to talk about is we are living in the last times, right? We are we are in these last days, and if you know anything about biblical prophecy, I mean, it doesn't take a whole lot to see that this world is winding down, <laughs> you know, that this world is coming to an end. When you think that the world can't get any sicker, they surprise you and they get a little sicker. And, um, and so, but all of this is spoken of and prophesied, and... Um, and it says, and look in verse 14, it says, Now Enoch, who lived in the seventh generation with Adam, prophesied about these people. He said, listen, what people? It's the people that in, in the end times. He said, listen, the Lord is coming with countless thousands of his holy ones or the saints to execute judgment on the people of the world. And he will convict every person of the ungodly things they have done for all and for all the insults that the ungodly sinners have spoken against him. We are living in a time where you're going to see, well, we've seen that the gospel of Jesus Christ, Jesus, the name of Jesus Christ, has been insulted, has been mocked, is scoffed, is ridiculed. You can, you can go to games and you can pray in Allah's name, you can pray in um, Buddha's name, but you cannot pray in the name of Jesus. You know, you can, you can say God, but that's like an all-encompassing, you don't really know which God you're talking about. But when it comes to the name of Jesus, there is power in that name. And this is the hour that you're going to see the spirit of the Antichrist, right, that is going to begin to mock. And I'm telling you what we're seeing and what we've seen in this demonstration of what happened on that last Thursday is the spirit of the Antichrist at work in this generation to mock Jesus and say, oh, no, 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 Jesus don't belong in this, in this rally. You must go down to that little one down there. You see, it's, it's, she's ridiculing, and she's talking about President Trump's rally down the street, who supposedly had a little pit of people, but I'm sure there were thousands. I, don't, I can't tell you how many were there, but that's not the point. The point is, is that in front of people, she wanted to mock and ridicule him by saying, oh, it's that smaller rally down the street is where you want to be. And so um, in, this, in this time, we have got to pay attention to those who are standing for Christ and for those who are separating themselves from Christ. You see, this isn't about a woman's right to choose. This isn't about, um, you know, helping blacks, about helping poverty, about helping women's rights. I mean, a lot of these are so blurred in the government. This is about light versus darkness, 
And the world doesn't understand that. And so that's why we can't get angry at the world. They don't understand that the Bible says that the God of this world has blinded the eyes of them lest they believe. So they don't understand the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ because Satan has blinded their minds to understand the message. But we who are the church, we carry that light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is the hour that we let it shine. This is the hour that we let the truth of God's word, that we unashamedly stand for Jesus Christ in this hour. I'm so proud of these young students, just barely 20 years old, that were so bold enough to take a stand for Jesus. They weren't, they weren't, they weren't saying anything in, in defamation. They're simply saying, saying, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. And, um, and so I, I love this generation that I believe God is raising up young men and women who unashamedly will stand for Jesus. Amen. Now in the Bible, um, there are, I mean, mockery is a, is a, you know, it's some, it's a tool of the enemy because he uses it to bring, you know, shame, intimidation. Matter of fact, the word scoffer, mocker, is someone who mocks and ridicules others based on their beliefs. So when you're mocked or you're scoffed, they're mocking you and making you feel bad about what you believe. And we see that in the end times, and Jesus even spoke of this as well, that in these last times, they're going to mock you. They're going to scorn you and scoff you for what you stand. And this is the hour. That's why Jude said, I want you to fight Fight for the faith. Fight for that which you believe. You know why? Because we know who our God is. We know he is true. We know he is faithful. We know that what he said he will do, he is going to do. And we know that the Bible is filled with prophetic prophecies, even looking at Jesus, things that, that no man could have fulfilled, but Jesus did. And, and so we see God is a God of timing. The things that came to pass when he said they were going to come past, they came to pass. Everything is on God's timeline. And I'm telling you, this is the hour that we don't lose faith, that we don't lose heart. We become strong in this hour. We become bold because why? We know who our God is. And we got to stand for truth. Praying in the Spirit. Praying in the Holy Spirit. Uh, and, and, and this is what, you know, in this hour, you know, what you do publicly is nothing compared to what you do privately. Your private life right now is crucial to your survival. What do I mean by that? Well, what are you doing with your time? What are you watching? What are you listening to? What are you feeding yourself on? I mean, you could even be watching things. You could be watching the news, and that can bring a lot of fear inside of you. This is the hour that we as the church need to press in to the throne room of God. God has need of each one of us in this room to pray, to intercede, to build ourselves up in our most holy faith that we can leave the very throne room of God full of the Holy Spirit, full of the presence of God, carriers of his glory into a dark and dying world. Amen. Jesus, in, in Matthew uh, chapter 27, we see that in that chapter, it's the chapter where they take Jesus and they, um, the soldiers take him and they they beat him and they put a robe on him and they put a crown of thorns upon him. And the Bible tells us, well, we can, we can turn there and look at that. Because if they did this to our Lord and Savior, then um, we can't expect anything less. Amen. <laughs> um, in Matthew 27... Verse 27 says, Now some of the governor's soldiers took Jesus into their headquarters, and they called out the entire regiment. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and they wove thorn branches into a crown, and they put it on his head, and they placed a reed stick in his right hand as a scepter. They knelt down before him in mockery and taunted him. Hail, king of the Jews. And then they spit on him and grabbed the stick and struck him on the head with it. When they were finally tired of mocking him, they took off the robe, put on his own clothes and on him again, and they led him away to be crucified. And then it goes on and it says in verse, uh, they, they, they nail him onto the cross 
And um, two on the side, and I'll pick it up, verse 39. Now people that were passing by uh, shouted abuse and shaking their heads in mockery. And they said, look at you now, as they yelled at him. You said you were going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Well then, if you're the son of God, save yourself and come down from the cross. Then the leading priests, the teachers of the religious law, the elders also mocked Jesus. He saved others, they scoffed, but he can't save himself. So he is the king of Israel, is he? Let him come down from the cross right now and we will believe in him. He trusted God, so let God rescue him now, if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. And even the revolutionaries, the two, the two uh, thieves on the cross who were crucified with him, they ridiculed him in the same way. They're ridiculing Jesus, but what was Jesus' response? Jesus knew why he was on that cross. Jesus knew what he was doing, and everything that they were saying him was not deterring him from his goal and his purpose. He came, the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. This was the purpose, the reason Jesus came. He came to destroy the works of the devil, and he was not going to be de detoured or altered or ridiculed or shamed. You know, it says by the by the, the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, endured the shame that he went through. And he was so determined to finish what he had started, he, it just didn't even faze him. This is what you and I, we are his body. And in the hour that we're living in, I believe that we can't be, you know, be moved by the ridicule, by the scoffing, by the mocking us, by the laughing at us. I mean, this is my Jesus. This is my Savior. This is my Lord. And I unashamedly will stand for the cross of Calvary. You know, the Bible, again, is, is full of stories, um, stories like this. In 2 Kings chapter 18 is another story. And, you know, the enemy loves to intimidate and to, and to yell things. And, and this is like, this is a long passage. I don't want to read all of it. I'm going to read bits and pieces of it, but I encourage you to go back and read 2 Kings 18 and 19 about the story of Hezekiah. The Assyrian king um, brought his chief of staff and told him to give this message to Hezekiah. And I'll listen to what he says to him. This is what the great king of Assyria says. Why are you trusting in that makes you so confident. Do you think that mere words can substitute for military skills and strength? Okay, right now, he's hitting, he's hitting him. He's trying, you see, the enemy wants to put subtlety thoughts into the mind that we have a great military strength and you're a weakling. And this is how the enemy, that's, this is how he, he works. He takes words and he twists them. And, and if we listen to what's being said, it can mess us up. And this is what he's trying to do. He's trying to mess him up. He says, who are you counting on that you have rebelled against me? On Egypt? If you lean on Egypt, it will be like a reed that splinters beneath your weight and pierces your hand. And Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, is completely unreliable. But perhaps you will say to me, oh, we're trusting in the Lord our God. Can't you just hear him mocking him? Oh, we're trusting in the Lord our God. But isn't he the one who was insulted by Hezekiah? Didn't Hezekiah tell, tear down his shrines and altars and make everyone in Judah and Jerusalem worship only at the altar here in Jerusalem? Okay, he's got this whole story wrong. Yes, you know, he tore down the shrines of false pagan gods. All these false pagan gods he destroyed and told them, you will worship G or God only, Jehovah only, and, and he alone is God. And look at verse 23, I tell you what, strike a bargain with my master, the king of Assyria. I will give you 2,000 horses if you can ride that many men, find that many men to ride in them. With your tiny army, how can you think of challenging even the weakest contingent of my master's troops, even with the help of Egypt's chariots and charioteers? What's more do you think that we invaded your land without the Lord's direction. The Lord himself told us, attack this land and destroy it. Do you hear the subtleties of the enemy? 
He, he's, he's telling them, you're just, you have a tiny army. That little, you, you're at the wrong rally, that small one down the street. <laughs> you're, you're a minority. You're, you know, there, there's not a lot of you. You know, you're weak. And, and then how do you know that? It's not God himself that raised us up in this hour. Matter of fact, there's an evangelical group of, I'm not going to say believers, but an evangelical group of people <laughs> that supports this campaign. They support the murdering of children. They support the slaughtering of our children. They support the, the speaking against the Jesus that they're supposed to love. Again, light and dark, the separation, Christ, our culture. This is the hour that we're living in. And it goes on and, um, and it says that, I love this. I, I want to read this whole passage because it's powerful. But he says, Then Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, Shebna, and Joah said to the Assyrian chief of staff, Please speak to us in Aramaic, for we understand it. Don't speak in Hebrew, for the people on the wall will hear. Well, this just made him that much more excited. Like, oh, really? Well, <laughs> he says, listen, do you think my master sent this message only to you and your master? He wants all the people to hear it. For when we put this city under the siege, they will all suffer along with you. And they will be so hungry and thirsty that they will eat their own dung and drink their own urine. I mean, he's prophesying Israel's defeat right here. Verse 28, and then the chief of staff stood and he shouted in Hebrew to the people on the wall. Listen to this message from the great king of Assyria. This is what the king says. Don't let Hezekiah deceive you. He will never be able to rescue you from my power. Now, this is the voice of the enemy. Come on, this is like the enemy. This is like Satan's voice in your life, right? He says, don't let him fool you into trusting the Lord by saying, the Lord will surely rescue us. The city will never fall into the hands of the Assyrian king. Don't listen to Hezekiah. These are the terms that the king of Assyria is offering. Make peace with me and open the gates and come out. And he goes on, he, he just continues this dialogue, try, you know, trying to send fear, trying to send confusion, trying to get them to turn against the authority, to turn their back on King Hezekiah, and mostly to turn their back on the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And what I love about King Hezekiah, the leader in this hour, he says that when he heard this report, he tore his clothes and put on burlap, and he went into the temple of the Lord. And then he sent a message to the prophet Isaiah. And Isaiah sends back, and here's what, here's what the Lord says to the king. He says, listen, do not be disturbed by this blasphemous speech. Listen to me tonight. Come on. We need to hear the word of the Lord as, I mean, they're, they're not even hiding the agenda. But God says, do not be disturbed by this blasphemous speech against who? Against me, says the Lord. Listen, for I myself will move against him. And then the king will receive a message that he's needed at home. Well, they, it goes on and, and God begins to tell him this whole strategy, which is so powerful. And so uh, he comes back and he's trying, you know, the enemy comes back and he's, he's yelling more junk at the people. The king now takes the letter and, and this, I love this. What does he do? He takes the letter and it says he opens it in the temple, he spreads it out before the Lord, and he prayed to the Lord. This is what we need to do. We need to take the, the newspaper, to take the things, the blasphemes, to take the, the slaughtering of our children, the decimation of their bodies, and um, you know, just all, all of the horrendous things that are happening, lay it out before God. And what does it say? Hezekiah, Hezekiah prayed to the Lord. And he said, O Lord God of Israel, you are enthroned between the mighty cherubim. And you alone are God of all the kingdoms of the earth. You alone created the heavens and the earth. Now bend down, O Lord, and listen. Open your eyes, Lord, and see and listen to Sennacherib's words of defiance against the living God. We need to say, God, listen to the words of defiance against your son, Jesus. Listen to these words, Lord. 
And it goes on and he says, it's true, Lord, that the king of Assyria has destroyed all these nations and they have thrown over their gods of these nations into fire and they burned them. But of course they did because they were not gods at all. Only idols of wood and stone shaped by human hands. But now, O oh Lord, our God, rescue us from his power. Then all the kingdoms of the earth will know that you alone are God. Now, this is a mighty stand. This is a stand before anything changes. This is a stand that he's taking as the enemy is threatening and, and, and speaking these things. And, you know, I, I pray to God that we get the right person into the office that will take a stand for righteousness, that will protect our religious freedoms, that will, you know, will, but if the other one gets in, I'm telling you, this, this is what you, you're going to see. You're in the wrong rally. Jesus isn't in this rally. Jesus will not be in this this in her policies in 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 her um, in her presidential whatever. <laughs> Jesus is not welcome there, and if if it ends up in being in this area, then even more so will we have to stand for Jesus, and even in the threats, we have to make a stand for Jesus. But in this hour, I believe we have a time of mercy. We have a time that we can change the tide. And how do we do that? Do we do that by rioting? Do we do that by causing fights and wars in the street? No, we do it by prayer. We do it by coming before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in whom they have uh, you know, spoken against. It's just like in the days of David. When Goliath came out and he defied the armies of Israel and he mocked them as well. And the all of army of Israel hid and, and they, they, they were terrified of Goliath. But here comes this young boy, David. And he's listening to what Goliath is saying. He's like, well, who is this that's defying the armies of the living God? And it says that when David went before King Saul, basically King Saul mocked him. He says, you're just a child. This man, he, he's been a warrior for years and, and, you know, and then, so the king mocks him and then he actually goes and he, he goes out to fight Goliath and Goliath mocks him. Who am I, a dog that you're bringing me a stick? And his brother, you know, his brother mocked him and said, why have you come out here? I know, I know, I know your heart. I know the wickedness of your heart. And, and, and so David was mocked. He wasn't seen for who he really was, but it didn't move David. David knew his God. He didn't let the identity that people were trying to throw on him, that you're weak, that you're small, you're a minority, you have, you don't have the strength, you don't have the wisdom. Come on, you, whatever it is, he didn't care. It's not by might nor my power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. I don't come in my strength. Strength. And David said, I don't come to you with a sword and with a spear, but I come against you in the name of the Lord God, whom you have defied this hour. God needs us, David, to rise up. Amen. Back in that story in Hezekiah, I love this. Uh, it's amazing. You want to know how it ended? In thir verse 35, it says, that night, the angel one angel, say one angel. one angel. Pastor Mark's been teaching us about angels. What that night, the angel of the Lord went out to the Assyrian camp and he killed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. When the surviving Assyrians woke up the next morning, they found corpses everywhere. Then King Sennacherib of Assyria broke down camp. He returned to his own land. He went home to his capital of Nineveh and he stayed there. And one day while he was worshiping in the temple of his God, his sons came in and they killed him. Now, we're, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not speaking death over anybody, but I'm saying God knows how to vindicate. God knows how to, to deal with the enemy. Well, you know, he knows how to keep the righteous as he kept, kept Lot and brought judgment upon Sodom and Gomorrah. He knew how to keep Noah and protect him while he brought judgment upon the earth. And God's going to keep and protect us. We who take a stand and we stand for righteousness, we stand for truth unashamedly, Knowing and declaring that Jesus is my Lord. I mean, I think we all need to get those shirts. Jesus is King. <laughs> Amen. He is Lord of all. Well, it is 730. Oh my goodness. That went really fast. 
But I hope you're encouraged tonight. You know, I, in Jude, um, and back there, I, I just want to, I'm going to close with, again with what it said. Um, because as he's saying that we're supposed to defend the faith, to stand for the faith, he said, defend the faith that God has entrusted to you. This is our hour to defend the faith. How he goes on in verse 20, build each other up in your most holy faith by praying in the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to pray. Build yourself up in prayer. Build yourself up in, in going into that secret place of the shadow of the Most High, amen, where nothing, no evil, no demon can touch you. Father, we just glorify you tonight. We thank you. We thank you that you are a powerful God. And the only reason, God, that you've to you're tolerating and you're just like Jesus, you he tolerated because there is a job to be done. And the job to be done in this hour is souls of men, souls of women. God, you said that you are long-suffering because you want everybody to be saved. And God, we pray that, Lord, we, your church, would just not be silent in this hour, but that we, Lord, that there would be a great harvest of souls that would come in. God, that there would be hunger for Jesus in this hour. And God, may we be ready, built up in our most holy faith to take a stand and to give a reasonable hope of the glory of the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Bless each one tonight, Father, I pray. And we honor you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.